it is worth it to yourself to spend a little bit of time knowing your numbers, figuring out your taxes. If you just spend an hour or two every single month keeping your numbers up to date, figuring out different tax strategies, and just that little bit of time is so worth it. Welcome, welcome. Hey, hey. So, uh, super excited for today's guest, man. This is going to be uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. It is. Should we, br- should we bring her in? Let's do it. All right. Well, if you're looking for a tax coach, that's her handle. Your tax coach. We have the one and only Barbara on the show, Real Estate First Technology. Super excited to have you in. It's been a while. I, I we were on at an event, I think last year sometime. I said I wouldn't want to get you on the show. And then here we are finally like almost a year later because you're so busy. So the viewers and listeners out there, you're in for a real treat because uh, Barbara's busy. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So let's get a little bit into it. So why taxes? How did how did you fall into the world of taxes? I know it's not the most funnest topic, but you know anyone that follows you on social media, go follow her Instagram down below. You do things way differently, I have to say. Kudos to you for your approach with your marketing and your videos and making it fun for people because taxes aren't fun <laughs> for a lot of people. They're fun for so, her. It is. It is, actually. <laughs> they can be fun. Um, but I think I am different because I was never supposed to be an accountant. Like I was a junior in college. I was majoring in marketing and I got pregnant. And so I went to my career counselor and I was like, I am having a baby and I can't risk not having a job the day I graduate school. So what major do I need to switch to, to like a hundred percent chance I'm going to have a job. And they were like accounting. And I was like, shit, are you sure? Is that the only major? Um, And they're like, yeah, you should probably switch into accounting. Plus, it's easy to switch into probably because not very many people want to do accounting. But yeah. um, so I switched and got ended up getting my master's in taxation and started out my career at the largest accounting firm in the world, which sounds really cool and prestigious. And, you know, that's what everyone strived for in college. And I got there. I, you know, got off the elevator in the 27th floor in this huge building in a big city. And I was like, I really made it, you know, and. I step out the elevator and I was like, this is what people like strived for. Everyone looked so tired and miserable. And then once I actually started working there, I was like, they're not helping anyone. Like all they're doing is putting numbers on a form and turning it in by the due date, April 15th. And they Mm. think that they're doing a great job. And I just kept year after year, I was like, there has to be a better way. And so it took me 10 years, but 10 years um, of corporate accounting, I was finally like, I'm going to start my own thing where like, I don't have to bill for every six minutes I talk to someone and we're all we're going to do is save people money in taxes and find like dig in and find ways to save and have really good communication. Because also if you've worked with accountants Mm -hmm. before, like typically they suck at responding to anything. And I'm like, why? Like, it doesn't have to be that way. And so that's your tax coach started in 2020 and now here we are. Wow. That is awesome. Congratulations. And for to start your own thing, right? I think a lot of individuals, they'll just work their nine to five and they'll spend 30 years of their life and they'll just be miserable and just like, Oh, well, you know, and then the deathbed, they're like, well, should have did something differently. So kudos for you for, for going for it and doing what you wanted to do to, and then also making it fun, which is, which is awesome. So, and then you're located here locally in Arizona, I believe, right? Yeah. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. We're kind of like nomads like, at this point. Like we travel so much. It's weird to say like we're in Arizona, but yes, we have a house in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> we live there, but we got clients across the country and I can imagine all over the place as you're serving supporting. So do you ser- specifically uh, niche down on any, any industry or you know, if agents are out there listening and they want to utilize your services, you're, you're pretty much fair, fair, open game to work with anyone. We really only work with business owners or real estate investors. So if you're like two okay. W2 earners, we're typically not taking those people on unless they're wanting to invest in real estate. But at this point, since I am a big real estate investor, 
probably over half of our clients are in the real estate industry in some way, shape, or form, like they're agents or they're brokers or more in mortgage or investors themselves. And so if we had a niche, it would probably be real estate, but we help all types of business owners. I love that. Lots of real estate agents out there listening. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about the investment space for taxes because uh, I've filtered through a few CPAs over the years because they just don't understand what's going on. Um, what are the, some of the creative ways to help the real estate investor really take full maximum, you know, maximum profit or right off? Well, first, I think it's understanding rep status or if you're not a rep. And so if you've heard the term rep before, it's a real estate professional in the eyes of the IRS. And that does mm. not mean a real estate agent. That's also a common mm. misconception. So if anyone for anyone out there that owns an investment property, you're either a rep or you're not. And you want to try to be a rep in the eyes of the IRS because then all of your real estate losses can offset like business income, other active income that you have, even W-2 income. And so it's really how do we become a rep or can we use a spouse that can be a rep, something like that. And so the gist of it is you need to spend 750 hours a year in real estate and more than anything else. So if you have a W-2 job, you typically can't qualify because you're probably spending 2,000 hours a year in your W-2 job. That's not going to be more than real estate. Um, but a lot of times clients come to us, one of them is a business owner, one of them is maybe a stay-at-home spouse, and so we can try to get them to qualify. So you want to hit the 750-hour mark, and then you have to materially participate, which I won't bore you with all the details. There's seven tests to it. But really, we try to get people as much as we can. Can we get you a rep? Because that's the best way in real estate to save money. If there's no way that you can be a rep because you can't spend enough hours on it or you're both W-2'd or something like that, then it's best to probably invest in Airbnbs or short-term rentals because there's some loopholes with short-term rentals. So those are like the two biggest ways. And then of course, no matter what investment property you have, we can do a cost segregation study, which accelerates your depreciation. And I can go into depth in that if you want, but if you have a follow-up question there. Do you have that. to do the cost seg the first year you own it, or can you do the cost seg a few years later after you've acquired an asset? Great question. You can do a cost seg anytime. And the IRS allows you to do that because you're actually supposed to do a cost seg study. So most people don't know that, but cost segs are required. And um, But most people don't know about them. Most people don't do them. They just depreciate their stuff over 27 and a half years and call it a day. But what I've seen happen before is if your tax return gets pinged by the IRS, like they're going to audit your tax return. And let's say you report your rentals on your personal return. Most people do. If your return, if they're auditing your return, they're going to look at your rental property and they're going to say, hmm, you depreciated this rental over 27 and a half years, but you didn't say that the windows are five-year property and the floors are five-year and, and certain equipment seven years and blah, 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 blah. And you didn't take that depreciation, so we're going to take it from you because you were supposed to take it. And so the IRS will never let you take that depreciation ever again because you were supposed to take it faster than you did. And then you just like get screwed. So you're supposed to have a cost seg study every time you own a property. Most people only get it if they think they can be a rep, but it really like everyone should get one. Wow. Yeah, I should do that right now. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah. we do them. Yeah, well, we should talk after this. But uh, <clears throat> also in terms of that, I want to talk about flipping homes and if you're a rep versus not being a rep, because a lot of people that that question always brings up capital gains, right? Are you a dealer of homes versus are you flipping for a profit? And can you explain that a little bit in terms of clarity on the flipping side? Yeah. So there's two ways the government, the IRS can look at you when you are flipping homes. Typically, if you're just flipping one a year, you can probably get away with it being more of an investment property and you can pay less in taxes, like capital gains, you'll pay 20% or less. If you're flipping more than one home a year, and there is not a number in the Internal Revenue Code, but there are case laws. And typically the IRS is looking at how many homes you flip a year. And it's usually if you flip more than one. Some people will say more than three. 
But to be on the safe side, if you're flipping more than one a year, you're probably going to be looked at as an active trader business. And so when you're selling the property, it's now going to be ordinary, which means your regular tax rate. So that could be 22%, 37%. Um, if you're in California, you're now over 50% in taxes probably. And so if you can try to stick to one a year, but if like you're trying to make money, if this is your only business, like flip away, you know, and then we can do other strategies to lower your taxes, like becoming an S corporation and then figuring out how to like buy cool cars or put in retirement plans. They could be self-directed. So then you can buy more real estate with your own retirement plan, things like that. Mm. And- Sorry for all the questions, but this I'm trying to keep this like real estate related. So there's so much value in some yeah. tons of value here. <clears throat> where is that level for a real estate agent in terms of commissions where I've made the switch? I'm an S Corp. I might pay myself now a salary. The that question I always get from new agents is should I start an LLC as a real estate agent and filter all of my business through my LLC? And I typically tell them from what I was advised was that the, you need to make about $110,000 a year to make that shift from 1099 to corp and start paying yourself. Am I wrong? And Everyone's okay. going to have a different yeah. answer. I, don't, I would say no one is wrong, but I'll tell you my thought process behind it. So I would say from the very beginning, any agent out there, please get your LLC or PLLC depending on your state rules because you will get sued at some point in your career if you're selling a lot of homes. So don't let someone sue you and take your property and your assets. So please get your LLC, but your LLC will not save you a single penny in taxes. So don't get that misconstrued, but it'll protect you. But having your LLC is kind of like your safeguard into becoming an S corp. We can't switch you to an S corp until you've had your LLC. So get it now. So you're ready when you're ready. Yeah. In terms of how much money should I make to switch to an S Corp, I honestly say right away because you're 15 times less likely to get audited if you're an S Corporation than on your personal return. So that in and of itself, if you don't want to deal with an audit, which nobody probably wants to deal with an audit, and even if you have nothing to hide, right? I'm always like, Yes, please bring on the audits. Like, we're happy to defend you. There's nothing to hide. But what it is going to take from you is hundreds of hours of your life that you could be going out there and making money. And you're going to have to pay me for hundreds of hours of my time as well. And so, just the like safety net of 15 times less likely to be audited, I think everyone in as an agent should be an S Corp. But not everyone thinks like that. And people want to know the cost benefit analysis. I mean, I think my time is like worth way more than that. But if you're not putting like money to your time, around $40,000 in commissions, the cost benefit makes sense. You're going to be saving more in taxes at about 40K of commissions than like the cost of becoming an S Corp because you have to pay like a payroll company and you have to pay for another tax return because you now have two tax returns, stuff like that. But I think everyone should be. I love that. That's awesome. So let's go a little deeper in the subject of like, what would you advise for a licensed real estate professional? Because a lot of them don't really treat their business like a business. They they kind of um, one deal at a time, or they'll get a deal and then they'll buy something fancy or whatever the case may be. And they don't really they don't really have like um, a lot. Don't do the P and L sheets. A lot don't have um, themselves on payroll. So what would you say and advise someone listening and viewing as far as? getting on payroll, setting up that LLC, um, whether it's hiring your services or what have you, Augusto, Bench Accounting, having a P&L, what would be like a basic roadmap to follow for an agent who's new in the business or who's has now just had a couple transactions and they're on track for say 12, 24 homes this year and and they need to be ready for what's going to come as far as the tax implications? Yeah, I would say keep track of your income and expenses really meticulously. And that doesn't mean you have to get a bookkeeper right away. For most agents, even until you're at a couple hundred thousand dollars, you probably don't need a bookkeeper if you're tracking it yourself on a spreadsheet, but make sure you're tracking Mm -hmm. it. And a spreadsheet is fine if you can keep up with it. But if you're not doing anything, that's kind of like where you can get in trouble and you'll typically miss expenses. 
Like nobody's over, ever going to like over expense when they're not tracking something. You're going to be missing out on deductions, which means you're going to be paying more in taxes. So I would say just like figure out a system that works for you, whether it's just a spreadsheet where you're putting your expenses every month. You're not going to have that many when you first start out probably. But when you're to a point where you're like, I can't handle this anymore. I'm too busy. I love QuickBooks Online. And at that point, get a good bookkeeper. I would not recommend. I think you mentioned Bench. I We yeah. get so many clients from Bench that we clean up their stuff. Um, and it costs more to do yeah. a cleanup than it does to do like it right the first time. So QuickBooks Online is great because it also has a receipt tracker in there. If you get the app on your phone, you can just snap pictures of your receipts and it'll save it. It has a mileage tracker for you already. So when you're driving around for business, it'll track it for you. We love QuickBooks Online. I And I want to touch base on that because I... I'm on a few different boards in town and trying to like advise different businesses. And I don't know how many people do their books or they do their accounting sloppy in the beginning, instead of just setting it up, like you said, correctly the first time and paying for a QuickBooks subscription and, and doing things on, on the up and up is actually going to save you more money than being sloppy from the beginning. But there's so many owners, contractors, investors that I deal with on a regular basis that like just extremely sloppy. Are you seeing this with a lot of the clients that are coming to you uh, from that perspective? Yeah. Real estate investors, for some reason, are like the sloppiest people with their accounting. Like they're <laughs> trying to be so cheap and like scrimp every penny that they then have to pay people more to like fix it. We get so many investors that they'll put like their down payment as an expense on their profit and loss. And so like they have this huge loss on their P&L and they think they're not going to pay anything in taxes. And we're like, you put hundreds of thousands of dollars on your profit and loss. That is not an expense. Like those are assets. And and people just don't know those ter terms and don't know really what to do. And so... Yeah, I can get you in big trouble. Oh, my God. Listen up out there. <laughs> Don't get yourself in trouble. Clean things up and uh, go hire Barbara. Yeah. And Barbara, like, as we wrap this up, like, is there, are you hosting webinars? Like, where do you, where do you suggest real estate agents, real estate investors go to get more information uh, just to have general competency or to absorb some of this stuff that we covered on this, this podcast, that would be a resource for them as they set up this business and progress down their journey. Yeah. I would say the first place is our write off your life course. It teaches you how to be a good business owner, how to write off your life, like turn seemingly personal expenses into business expenses. And we are just launching probably by the time this episode is out, we will have launched it. We're launching it in March, but our big write off your real estate course, and it will have every single real estate tax strategy I have ever seen in 14 years. So whether you're buying properties, holding properties, selling them, flipping them, short term, midterm, long term, like anything and everything, um, inheriting property, how you want to give it away to your kids, like so many things. So that course as well. And I think agents should buy that course, even if they're not investing, because like, I have real estate agent clients that are selling $6 million investment homes to people that have never heard of a cost seg study. Like how much are, of a disservice are you doing to your clients if you're not advising them in the right way, you know? And so I think it's great info just for agents as well as investors. I love that. I especially sell a lot of investment properties and I, and I try to tell people like, if you don't have a general understanding of cost seg or 31 exchanges or any way Max, my write off, you are just putting your clients in a just a bad, bad place. So I'm glad you brought that. <laughs> how are you advising people if you actually don't know how to do it? So I love that. I love that too. No, and that's what it, that's what it, that's why we wanted to have you on, Barbara, because I think a lot of individuals don't understand that there's a lot of implications here. Better to be proactive than reactionary in the tax world, because uh, no one wanna ha has to deal with that. And the last thing I want to leave with before we close out is uh, when we started off the show, we talked about that new tax implication um, in regards to the government, there's a new entity. And if you're not filing this 
you know more than I, as far as $500 fine per day for the LLC. So can we just close out with that? And then we'll, we'll have you uh, close out our show so people can know like, Hey, what to look out for. And you know, it's serious business. No one wants to be charged $500 a day for however many days. It's I know so, this one is crazy. It's not a tax law. So don't kill the messenger. It's okay. coming out from FinCEN, which is the financial crime enforcement agency. So the IRS and FinCEN, they're both part of the U.S. Treasury. They passed this law actually in 2016, but it's taken them this long to implement it. And they're saying if you have any LLC out there, any type of entity, it doesn't have to just be LLC, but C-Corps, S-Corps, whatever, any LLC out there, you have to file a report with FinCEN that is the Beneficial Ownership Information Report. It seems like a quick little report. You can do it in 30 minutes probably for each LLC that you have, which sucks for us. We have like 50 LLCs that we have to file for, but um, just for ourselves. But um, where it gets tricky is it's, they want to know not every owner, but every beneficial owner. And what does that even mean? Well, they're saying if you have a CEO, if you have a COO, you have a CFO, anyone in a C-suite, anyone that can make a decision in your company, the government wants to know who that is in your business. And if you hire someone, fire someone, they quit, you have to turn in updates. And if you don't do these updates, you're getting fined $500 per day, as well as if you don't even file it in the first place by the due date. So this thing is going to get crazy. But the gist of it, if you started an LLC prior to 1-1 of this year, you have until the end of this year to file it. So we're telling all of our clients, just wait till Q4 because there's a bill out there that it, they might get rid of this because they say it's unconstitutional. But mm. but here's the big but. If you started an LLC this year, 1-1-24 or forward, you only have 90 days to file it. So you do need to file it this year. So if you've like bought a new investment property and you put it in an LLC, a new LLC this year, make sure you file it. You only have 90 days. One one next year, if this law like stays intact, one one next year you start an LLC, you only have 30 days to file. Wow. So it's a lot to try to keep up with. Jeez Louise. That that's that's crazy. And I just We'll see what happens, but we're so thankful that Barbara, you're on to be able to give us that information so we can be able to uh, share it with our viewers and listeners. And as we close out our show, what would you like to li uh, leave for our viewers and listeners, actually, that they can apply to their businesses to you know, take massive action? I mean, there's a lot of stuff we've covered. Of course, with the courses, go follow Barbara down below. Links are there. But is there anything that you want to leave in closing, something that comes up for you, maybe that you... I don't know, a common thing that you see that when you meet these clients that comes up that you want to leave for our listeners and viewers today. Yeah, I would say it is worth it to yourself to spend a little bit of time knowing your numbers, figuring out your taxes. It doesn't have to be scary and it can actually save you so much freaking money if you just spend an hour or two every single month keeping your numbers up to date figuring out different tax strategies and just that little bit of time is so worth it. Wow. Very well put. It's that simple. Don't make it overcomplicated. Thanks Barbara so much for being on the show today. We really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, Dan. Thanks for co-hosting as always. We'll be in touch, Barbara. Thank you so much. Yeah. I know, you know, it's funny too. Uh, <laughs> We're actually in between too, as we do are doing some things, my wife and I, and all the things we have going on as well. So uh, I'm glad that we reconnected. So it, it's awesome how, um, you know, just to reconnect get you on the podcast again, it's like, oh yes, Barbara, I've been looking for someone. <laughs> That's awesome. I love, it, I love it. Awesome. And uh, closing out the show, thanks to all our viewers and listeners, as it is our intention for you to take things from our, our show to apply to your business and have more massive success. Go, go check out your tax coach. She definitely, Barbara, is someone that you might want to follow, like, connect with. Check out those courses. Check out Liftoff Agent, our sponsor of the show. Thanks so much for tuning in. Like, subscribe, notification bell. We have new shows coming out every single week. See you all on the next one.